confidence, uh, Swahili study confidence, Baraza confidence. Um, and uh, I want to start, of course, by thanking our main organizers of this event, uh, Ija Ajivarianus and um, Angelica Bashira. Thank you, Ida and Angelica, uh, for organizing this event. I believe we are in year six of, um, of, our, um, of our annual event, and I shall simply hand it over to you, Angelica, to welcome our panelists, or Ida to welcome our panelists, and to say, I hope you have a very good conference today. Hello, hi, yes, yeah, so that was Wayne Dooley, Dr. Wayne Dooley, who is uh, the chair of uh, African, Center of African Studies here at SOAS. So I will speak in Swahili, and Angelica will, will speak in, in, in English after, because I'm sure our audience uh, are Swahili members. Kwa hivyo karibuni sana katika hili kongama retu la baraza, la hapa SOAS, na leo tumefurahi sana kwa mba nyenyote meza kujiunga nasi, na kujumuika na, na sisi leo, Ratiba yetu imeshehena, tunaweza kusema hivyo, na tumesha mua kwamba tulajitahidi kama itakavuwezekana kutunza muda, lakini kama tutakuwa tumechelewa hapa na pale, itabidi mtu samehe. Kila muasilishi atakuwa na daika kama, za kuzungunza kama ishirini, halafu mwisho kutakuwa na maswali. Kama unasoi la haraka, tafadhali liyeke hapo kwenye, kwenye chat, tutaweza kulisomo kuli, kuli kebadae. Kwa hivyo karibuni sana, na baraza hili limetayarishwa na Angelica Basquera, Wayne Duni, Mimi Hidaji Fayanes, na Professor Lutz Martin. Asante ni sana. Angelica. Um, hello everybody, welcome um, to our uh, um, sixth baraza. Um, I am very pleased to be here today again to celebrate Swahili studies um, at SOAS and uh, a big thank you to Ida for uh, bringing um, the program together and uh, we are very pleased to see so many of you here from across the world, from East Africa, um, Germany and uh, UK um, to spend a day to talk about um, different aspects of uh, Swahili studies. And as you've seen from the program, it's very varied in terms of different topics to be looked at. Um, and uh, yes, we have a very busy program, uh, which is great, and we want you to accommodate as many people as possible. Um, therefore, uh, um, we will be quite strict with the timing for the speakers, and uh, so that there will be also space for, for uh, question and answer. Um, the question and answer session uh, uh, will be live, therefore you will be able to uh, speak and, um, and we will be able to see you. Uh, you will have to uh, raise your hand in order to do so once, once we get to that point. Anyway, we will remind you uh, the procedure. Um, I don't want to take too long as well because, yes, we have a packed program. We want to start uh, with our first speaker. Um, um, in, the, in the chat, you will see that the speaker's bio and the speaker's um, abstracts have been uh, posted uh, because we don't have time now to uh, go over that. So you can still refer to those documents um, about each presentation. And uh, yes, yeah, so I will now pass it on to Ida. If you have any questions, you can always put it in the chat for us. Um, and now I'll um, pass back to Ida to start with panel one. And again, welcome everybody. And thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Thank you very much for that, Angelica. So just to recap, I will put, um, I will raise a hand when it's 15 minutes. Um, and then you'll have five minutes until the end of your presentation. Karibuni sana, you are very, very welcome. We have, uh, uh, okay, Jalul, am I saying that all right? Okay, Jalul Amari, um, uh, Ahmad Kipacha, uh, Francisca Faye, who was at SOAS for many, many years. So it's good to have you back. We also have Rachel Maina from Kenya. Thank you very much. And um, we'll also have uh, Omar Kibulanga from uh, Lamu, Kenya. So the first uh, speaker is Jalul um, Amari, who will be talking about Yahya Ali Omar's Matembezia Peponi, translation, translocality, and the conceptual history of the Swahili coast. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Beautiful. OK, good morning to everyone. Uh, please excuse me if my speech is a little slurred. It's a little bit early on the East Coast of, of the United States right now. Um, 
it's it's so beautiful to be able to to be in conference with you all and i wish that we could be all in person uh, so looking forward to a day when that can happen. But I would like to thank the organizers for making this possible. Uh, this little project that I'm working on is in a very early stage. So I would like to be able to bounce these ideas off. So I thank you guys again for putting this together so that there's room to, to kind of tease these ideas out. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen and I'm going to have a, uh, a little slide up there. Please let me know if there is a technical problem. Share screen. Uh oh, it's not possible. Okay, so we will keep this purely verbal. No, uh, hold on. Um, uh, maybe, maybe the um, are you, um, yeah. Are we able to? Um, yeah, you, you can share the screen now. Yeah, please share now. Okay, now it's possible. Thank you very much. Right, can everybody see what I am looking at? Is there a slide that says Yahya Ari Omar's Matembezi ya Peponi? Beautiful. Okay. And since I'm teasing these ideas out, my email is also on the bottom of this slide. Uh, if anybody wants to follow up and send me some notes to uh, help me grow as a scholar, I would much appreciate that. All right, I'm going to begin by, um, by reading a, a couple of little quotes and then tying them back to a Swahili context. Uh, what I'm trying to do with this project, although the title of it is very specific, like I'm focusing only on this one work of translation on the part of Yahya Ali Omar, a very creative work of translation. What I'm really doing is a much, much bigger reach and perhaps it's too big of a reach. And this is kind of what I wanna bounce off of you. But it seems to me like there's something deeply important about this project and projects like it in this period uh, for those of us that are thinking about something else in the world. Uh, so I'm going to bounce it off you and see what happens. All right, so here are the first three things I want to say that are from outside of a Swahili context. Number one, writing is the outlining and shaping of letters to indicate audible words, which in turn indicate what is in the soul. This is from Ibn Khaldun a long time ago. Second, Je te fais savoir que je n'écris jamais quelque chose ni ne le parle sans qu'il soit venu du fond de mon cœur. Je porte à ta connaissance que mes paroles sont conformes à mes actes. This, to do a loose translation, I want you to know that I never write anything and I never speak anything unless it comes from the depths of my heart. I carry, and I want you to know that my words conform with my acts. And this is from uh, Amadou Bamba in West Africa. And then third, what puts a thing into condition? That is, arranges it, disposes it favorably, speech. What damages a thing? Speech. What keeps a thing as it is? Speech. Okay, and this is, uh, that's Amadou Hampate Ba from writing in the UNESCO General History of Africa. Those three things, I, I dwelt upon them because I'm now going to say three things from a Swahili context, specifically around three scholars that I'm focusing on for this bigger project. One of whom is Yahya Ali Omar. The first thing is from Alamin Mazrui. Since the Europeans arrived, they have transformed Swahili and spoiled it in whatever way they like. They have reduced some of the letters that must be included in some of the words. And sometimes the meaning changes for lack of those letters. They have composed books of grammar, and sometimes those who have composed these books are foreign Europeans that do not know this language well. And those that put mistakes in them are Europeans from inland that do not know Kiswahili. And when they are told by someone from the coast that they are mistakes, they do not accept as authoritative anything other than that which is theirs. Now moving to the history of Kiswahili from Shihabuddin Chiragdin. I know this is a long introduction, but I promise you it's important to have all of these things in the, in the background, in the palette. And he says, Matarajio yangu ni kuwa waandishi wengine wa historia, watayafanyia uchunguzi zaidi mambo haya, na maenezi ya lugha ya Kiswahili, na hasa pingamizi zilizowekewa lugha hii na ukoloni wa kiengereza. So with these things in mind, I'm moving on to the description of the bigger project. Five minutes down, 15 to go. In its broadest sense, this project seeks to trace an epistemic and ethical reorientation brought about by the colonial moment in Islamic Africa, writ large. 
It is concerned with how wholly new or radically changing institutions were animated and adapted in attempts at creative continuity and with how the very form of those institutions may have impinged on such attempts. Its overarching focus, however, is on language as a kind of meta institution, an organizing matrix in which these processes unfolded. Beginning from a specific set of circumstances on the Swahili coast, it traces the movement of key concepts across several genera of multilingual discourse and explores their relationship to changing subjectivities. Now to be specific, in 1930, a British committee began standardizing Swahili as a lingua franca for colonial East Africa. They were charged to regulate this standard as an institution bridging speakers of hundreds of other languages and thus made responsible for the production of translocal knowledge in its most literal sense. They settled on a dialect that had developed currency through trade, mission work, and colonial government, and then used it as a platform for engineering an official grammar and lexicon. Standard dictionaries, manuals, and lists of new meanings became blueprints, and with them, the committee aimed to build the library that would define the colony's future. They were as concerned with governing language use in schools as they were with presses, and their explicit commitment was to develop this new standard as a vessel for the modern world. There were no mother tongue speakers of Swahili at committee meetings for the first 16 years of its existence. Colonial officials used the language it produced to administrate and rule, and anti-colonial nationalists used it to organize, resist, and build a government of their own following independence. Yet, narratives of both types played down this critical point. There were, in fact, people who belonged to a language world against which this standard was engineered. Such narratives likewise underestimated the fuller implications of this standard and what it might mean that it was the framing denominator for both political valences. Among mother tongue speakers in Mombasa, a pattern of discourse centered on language itself emerges in this period. It raises provocative questions about this increasingly languaged pressure towards the modern and the stripping of pre-modern or non-modern and Islamic form and content that this entailed. Colonial and anti-colonial reformations provoked lines of tension in concept, logic, and lived cosmology that overflowed strictly political or ethnic categories of analysis. Along these lines, various efforts were made to oppose, co-opt, or sidestep the standardization moment through the creation and adaptation of alternatively languaged space, in which older webs of meaning were tended to and negotiated against the increasing flux in social, political, and economic forces. These webs were important because they formed the dynamic matrices in which all thought and action were constituted, matrices that we often neglect or granularly reduce for the way that our own, historically derivative of that same modernizing pressure, shape academic analysis. From within this adaptive frame, in aggregate no less than a total cosmology, mother tongue speakers use the same organs of press and pedagogy that the committee itself originally sought to influence, but via lifeways that ran laterally through these institutional formations to unite discursive genre commonly treated as separate in modern scholarship. My project locates nodal points for this languaging discursive turn in the work of three scholars in Mombasa between 1930 and 1977, Alamin Mazrui, Yahya Ali Omar, and Shihabuddin Chiragdin. They were all mother tongue speakers of the original language and bilingually proficient in classical Arabic. And all of them developed their life efforts in a specifically languaged sense. The project draws principally upon their work in teaching and translation, thus, the Matembezia Peponi, but with special attention to lateral lifeways that bridge a variety of discursive spaces, from the faculty student parent networks that animated the colonial secondary school, to informal circles of debate and learning in mosque hadakas, from the colonial Qadi court to bilingual periodicals called Islah, from language textbooks to children's tales to dances, weddings, soccer teams, and poems, all of which were brought together in the life work of Mazrui. Omar and Chiragdin. These imbrications were not just local, but also translocal and mediated by Swahili, Arabic, and English. They included fields of both composition and comprehension, terms I prefer to production and consumption for evaluations of this kind of discourse. That is to say, they included both what these three scholars spoke, taught, wrote, and translated, 
and what they heard, learned, read, and understood. The overarching premise is that these spaces must be read in concert, intertextually, in any attempt to produce a conceptual history of the standardizing moment and its aftermath. I demonstrate that this kind of reading shows clear connections between them and sheds light on the way conceptual webs and their attendant logics were shifting under the pressure of the modern. Now, moving into Yahya Omar, Matembezi Apeponi, I want to read you something that he wrote. There's a, a really, really lovely tribute to him uh, that PJ uh, F. Frankel, uh, PJ L. Frankel wrote. Um, and in that, he, he, he mentions, he, he makes reference to, uh, to the written evidence that Omar submitted to the Commission on uh, coastal, coastal Independence. Uh, so when that British Commission was collecting written evidence, there's a letter in the archives at, at Kew, uh, the National Archives, uh, that's handwritten. It's, it's really powerful when you encounter it by Omar. It's handwritten in English. And this is what he says. I'm going to read this to you really quickly, and then I'm going to transition to a, a specific discussion of, of this translation. Um, first thing I want to tell you is that my English is very weak. I speak Swahili, and I know Arabic very well. I believe that you shall understand my views through my bad English. Now, remember, he's submitting this to a, an explicitly political commission. They're trying to figure out something that they have categorized as political. And this is what he says. When I read what anti-autonomists had said to you or wrote in the papers, I came to understand that all the opposition of autonomy resulted from printed misnames, which are in use in the press. These here are the misnames which I mean. Coastal Strip, Coast of Kenya, Sultan of Zanzibar, Sultan Dominions, Mwambao, autonomy. Here's the key. It means that the British rule had not connected this part of Swahili land with Kenya in practice, administration only, but also by wording. And only this last part, the wording, creating misnames which conflict with reality, only this last part is the force which caused all this opposition of our right. We, the Swahili nation, to re-independence and reunite all the points which they use in supporting their case are coming from these misnames. Being these false names also, the points which anti-autonomy draws from these words are false. It's a little messy in this space. His English, as he said, was weak. But what he's saying about language here is very strong. So my question is, when we look to this work of translation, Matembezi Yapeponi, which we see come out again, I believe in 1998, published by Frankel, in, in a, a revised edition. What I have on the slide right now is the original edition that was published. Uh, Omar dates it as the 31st of January, uh, 1959. And it's translated based on a work called Siyahatun uh, Fil Jannah, which was written by an Egyptian schoolmaster. Now, Franco says this in the introduction to the reprint, but he unfortunately misnames that author. So it can be difficult to find where this actual document is. Fortunately, uh, I was able to access it in the Darul Qutub in Cairo. Uh, and so you see a photograph of its first page on the left. Now, having both of these texts next to each other and being able to read them line by line against each other reveals that Omar, in fact, was doing a work of great creativity in translating this. This was not simply uh, just reproducing the thing line for line, word for word. It was not just trying to create an equivalence of meaning it actually domesticates it to a local space, which is fascinating because it's an appeal to the translocal networks that, that overflow colonial categories, colonial regional categories, in order to reinforce something that's distinctly local, which is a keen vita speaking sociolinguistic socio community's identity. So I wanna take a look at some of, some of what the, uh, what those, let me see if we can switch it here, what those look like. All right. Does everybody see what's happening here? It says, uh, this is line two. Oh, I can't actually hear any of you. So I'm going to assume that that's yes. All right. So we're looking at the two, the two uh, passages. This is line two of the story. Uh, what we have on the top is what Omar has rendered into Kimvita. And on the bottom, this is, uh, this is the Arabic. Uh, I apologize for the font. It was better on, on the other system I was using. Okay. So the first thing that he does is he changes the name of the character. Uh, 
immediately. And he, he adorns him with the title Sheikh. So he becomes someone that is in the way of either an elder or an authority. And he becomes somewhat of a, of a teacher as he relates this tale. This is important because Omar is translating this out of the context of also being a teacher. Um, and so in my bigger project, these acts of teaching and translation, which are shared both by Mazrui and Chiragdin, uh, are, are, are woven together. So he changes the name from Sareh to Ndoto. I won't translate any of the Swahili uh, because of my esteemed company. Uh, and then he changes Khayal, which, which means like the imagination or like, you know, the realm of, of imagining to Kweli. This is clearly not, a, not an attempt at translation for equivalence. Then he says, Aminipa Khabari, Kubu Amno. Whereas in the, in the other one, in the Arabic, it just says, Qala, he said, all right? So the idea of him giving news, it, he, he's integrated the character immediately into a kind of communal exchange of knowledge. He gave me khabari instead of just he said. Then it's the Arabic says, Sami'tu kathiran dhikr al jannah. Sami'tu, I heard. But in the Kimvita, it says, Siku zote kila hisoma khabari ya peponi na adyabu zilizomi. Na haswa hisoma maneno ya mtume. So it becomes a different kind of a medium, uh, like the, the rhythm of what's happening is no longer purely oral uh, as, it, as it seems to be coming across in the Arabic, but now it has this connotation of kusoma. Um, and then he leaves out a huge section of the, of the, of the Arabic and, and, and he returns to, to, to the quote. The quote he, he does in equivalence. Uh, and this quote is a hadith. In my bigger project, I, I trace all of the different origins and uh, context of these of these references that are that are contained inside of it. So you can see more of this uh, happening. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this because I see that I only have like three minutes. Uh, OK, there are a couple things that I definitely want to take a look at. Uh, one of them is there's a section, by the way, Omar leaves out an entire section. He, he removes an entire chapter. Uh, from the thing, and it happens to be a chapter in which in paradise, the narrator is uh, finding a wife. And there's like this passage about all these beautiful birds and the angel is talking to the narrator and says, you know, which bird is the most beautiful to you? And there's this whole sequence of, you know, choosing a companion in, in Peponi or Peponi. Uh, and Omar totally excises this from the thing and there's just no mention of it. So being able to, in future research, follow the, try to, to build some, something of an oral history. By the way, this uh, originally was translated for broadcast on Saudi Yamvita. Um, and so this was an oral presentation first, and then it was so popular with the listening audience in Mombasa that it was printed. And this is the printed version that I'm using here. Um, okay, when it's talking about, let me zoom to something that's a real distinct difference. Uh, there, are, there are questions in terms of subjectivity, uh, the way that things are translated, sometimes uh, the Arabic seems to be talking about almost like a personal possession. It says things like, when my feet, my feet trod those grounds. Uh, but in the Kimvita, Omar has it, when we stepped into that space, he repeatedly refers to the angel as Yule mal uh, Malaika. He does not say Malaki, my angel, like the, uh, the Arabic does. So there are all these kind of sensitive subtleties. And if you trace the differences, you start to ask questions about what is it that, that is informing these choices? And what is it inform that, that informs the, the very warm reception on the part of the Mombasan community of this version of the tale? Uh, here on this slide, you can see that what was Yubarikuha, this is uh, the, the uh, Jesus, alayhi salam, saying, it, it says that he blessed them. And, and the verb in Arabic is baraka, the same one that would be used if God were blessing someone. But in the Kimvita, Omar says, Yeye aya papasa aki yaombea baraka wa kiondoka huwa na furaha kabisa. This is clearly a distinction uh, because it's not saying he's aki ya bariki, aki yaombea baraka. So there are these subtle kind of theological points that are in it, even though Omar is not making any kind of claims to being a religious authority, you see these other vectors of, of, of conversation around what it means to be Muslim in Mombasa, in that local space, uh, through this translation. Uh, there's so much more to talk about, and I had some things that were convergences that were really cool, uh, but I'm going to leave you now because I'm at 20 minutes, I believe. Is this true? 
<laughs> yes, but oh my God, that that was fascinating. Thank you so much. I'll um, I did my PhD on, on translation. I looked at the norms of Swahili translation and listening to, okay, to you now, how so much has been domesticated. I think there's definitely a trend I can see there that we can talk about later in, in the QA. But thank you so much, Jalul. This is excellent. I'm sure people like um, Abdatif Abdallah in the audience will have questions for you later. So be ready. Um, our next um, speaker is uh, Ahmad Kipacha. And uh, he will be talking about um, sniffing oriental scents. So we are still um, and, and on the coast of East Africa, the eroticized Swahili odes. Ahmad Kipacha has, has been to Baraza previously and um, it's good to have you back, Ahmad. Karibu sana. Is he there? Hello. Hi, Ahmed. Okay. Are you, are you sharing a document? Mm, no, I'll just speak. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to put your video on, it might be better if we see you. Okay. Um, well, shall I, shall I put start video here? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Is it possible? I don't want to, I don't know. Oh, you, oh, you'll be able to see me here. Yeah? Ah, Musawa. Perfect. Vizuri yeah. sana. Okay. Asana. Okay. So you have okay. 20 minutes. Karibu. Okay. Thank you. I started at 11.42. All right. Um, simply, my topic is divided into two parts. Um, first is um, oriental sense. And then we have issues of classical Swahili poetry as uh, evidence of oriental sense. So why, why now? Why now should you start speaking of oriental sense? Perfume, issues of perfume in Swahili culture or Swahili civilization, why? It is because first, uh, if you go through a book of perfumes by you can Rimmel is a very famous book, a huge um, book um, of 1890 something. Um, you will see no mention of Swahili coast, the use of perfume in the Swahili coast. What he says about us is that um, there is very few or limited use of perfume in the uh, in the in this part of the world, and I, I argue uh, I want to argue against that. That's number one, and number two is when you go through tip tip uh, travelogy or the, in his book in his biography, you will see a mention of perfume, and that's fascinating. And he was given perfume by. Uh, 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 pa, um, by by one of the financial um, uh, financial of uh, of slave of the slave trade was also given a perfume. So that is very very interesting. And when you go through page one hundred and ten in his book, you will see a parcel of clothes, scarves, sashes, two heads, and foreign cloth, but also. Uh, two bottles of essence of roses and other alloys. So this is a, a part of the, of the package that was given by Tarja Topan, a very famous uh, uh, in East Africa, a very famous uh, uh, financial of the ivory and slave trade uh, in the caravan safaris. So it's a very interesting issue. And then when you go through proverbs, Swahili proverbs, you know, Swahili proverb is a reserve of, of facts, of, of, of uh, knowledge that we have, indigenous knowledge of, of, of Swahili, you will see a very interesting, a very, very interesting uh, proverb, which says, Mfuatana na manga unukato. Mfuatana na manga unukato. 
uh, I have a literary translation that one who follows an Arabian manga come close to smell like them. This is my own translation. You, you, you'll forgive me for if I don't get it right. So it's, it reminds public that once you rub off with the Arabian manga, you'll be influenced by their exotic fragrance. This is, this is something really, really interesting. And when you go through uh, scholars, recent scholars, uh, literary scholars, uh, such as uh, uh, um, Veth, Vec, Vec, Clarissa Vec. Clarissa Vec had something interesting in his one of his article in 2016. And then he says, she says in his, in his article, in her article, that pre-colonial Swahili text, most of which are poetry, have hardly been taken into consideration in recent debates on Indian Ocean connection. So this is uh, something of interest. And if you go through a number of uh, anthropological works by like, like Abdulaziz Lodhi, Oriental influences, Swahili, you see a lot of mentions of perfumes, numerous perfumes like kafur, ambergris, jasmine, musk, daffodil, Sandarus, Pachul, uh, as being of Arabic Indian origin. That's page 1937. So that's very interesting. But also, Rosabel uh, Boswell, in her book, Sense of Identity, Fragrance as Heritage in Zanzibar, she portrays in, in that book that there is a spraying of the housing, clothing, and also concussion of oriental atare or itili, such as rosewater, mesqui, sandalwood, zafarani, among people of Zanzibar and of course East Africa. So it make, Boswell makes it very clear that fragrance and other seemingly mundane heritage attract little attention in the preservation process. And yet this indicate important cultural continuity in the Indian Ocean region and form a part, vital part of heritage and the harmonization of culture in the island. So this is something of interest. So when you go through a number of poems, especially poems by, uh, I've, I've taken here two poems, two famous poems. The first one is poem by Mwana Kupona, it's a very famous one. And the second one by Fumoliongo, this is also uh, very famous. But apart from that, if you read also um, Abdallah Shiragbin and others, and also Said Abdallah Nasser, also you'll, you'll see mentions of the mention of, um, of sandalwood, mentions of rose water, et cetera, et cetera, Yasmin, Udi, and as, as very, very common in their work. So I would like to, to point on two major issues. First of all, uh, cross-cultural adornment, and second is centered bodies. These two poets, one is male, the other one is a female, have sp spoken a lot about body, body sense, or scenting our bodies. Oh. And then you will notice that, for instance, Solomon, uh, King Solomon, King Solomon also mentioned in Song of Solomon a poem very close to Fumoliongo. And I wonder why, why no one has seen this. For instance, um, Fumoliongo and Fumoliongo speaks about uh, a, a woman body centered in, in every part of it. And also Solomon described the same. Solomon starts start with the breast and call them as twins of gazelle, while Leongo compare them with fruit of pomegranate. In verse 10 of Song of Solomon, the erotic intimacy is described as most 
more intoxicating than wine. When Leongo tells readers that uh, after his lovemaking ended, he found himself as if possessed by spirit. So this is a very, very interesting. But the most remarkable similarity between Song of Solomon and Fumo Leongo's Utendua Manakupona, uh, Utendua Manamanga, is they have protected women, chastity. Leongo revealed that his woman body was not leaking. Therefore, the theory of leaky vessels, for those who knows about it, is a stereotype against women. But for these two males, they both protected or they both defended their, their women. They defended their wives and they are through the scent, but their body actually uh, fused with oriental scents and, uh, and so on and so forth. So they also mention a number of number of, of poem of, of perfume like aloe balsam, frankincense, myrrh, roses, saffron, and fruits of pomegranate and apples. So it's a very interesting issue that Mwana um, Kupona as well also mentioned perfumes and uh, the agent of, of her daughter to beautify herself and also her husband. And this, this is through uh, the use of wood or use of perfumes and different type of, uh, of, of, uh, or, or, of, or of, of, of uh, what is called atar or utiri, itiri, manukato in, in, in Swahili. Or uh, uh, in Swahili, we also use tarabizuna, tarabizuna to mean uh, all kind of perfumes. So in Manakupona, we read in, 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 in verse 138 that Dalia, leave no odor on your body by smearing rose water and fragrance powder. So this is interesting. Also, Naudi uh, umfukize mukurata waashia and perfume your husband with the wood incense morning and evening. So something interesting is, 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 is produced by, by Leongo and which um, has escaped the attention of critics. Uh, it's the connection between fragrance, pleasant fragrance, and maca. There is mention of manga and maca in Leongo's. Why so? Why in Utumbuizo Malama Malamnazi uh, there is also mentions of Pilawi Hindi, Sinia Shirazi, all this connection, and also lady from Maka or lady from Manga, etc., or even uh, the daughter of Hijaz. What's the connection between the two? Why mentioning Hijaz, Manga, and so so forth in connection to, 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 to women and also in connection to perfumes. Here is my argument. My argument is that the body has to be scented by perfume, but those perfumes are heavenly scent, so they connect you to spirit world. This is my argument. And that's why the mention of maca, manga, and comes uh, every time in this uh, in this in their in their works in their Swahili works. Scented bodies. There's a clear relationship between the oriental female body parts, olfactory sensuality and eroticism, in some of the work of uh, various uh, writers or uh, anthropologists, especially. Uh, odorizing body parts. Uh, uh, their presentation, removal of socially discreditable orders uh, is, is taking us part of the high civilization in the Western world. So too in Swahili world. Therefore, I would argue that if, when we consider civilization, when we consider a perfumery civilization, part of Swahili cost, 
Zanzibar, Mombasa, as seen in the poets of the of the great poets of uh, of the twenties and nineteen nineteen and twenty twenty century, is part of it. So we cannot exclude them in in, in their discussion. Um, I don't want to go deeper into the erotic, erotic part of the of uh, because this is still under under construction, but eroticism is seen in those two poems. And uh, if you go, uh, if you if you seriously or deeply read through some of the uh, metaphors like Noah's Ark, Safina. And some of the metaphors like uh, uh, Ngamani, Bilge. These give you a picture, or this is give you a sense of eroticism and also uh, uh, love making, love making in Swahili, and and it's 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 a it's something which has been camouflaged by metaphors. I like also to, to mention the use of pomegranate. Pomegranate has been mentioned, and I want to connect that with also a, a smell, the sense of smell, and also the sense of testing. In the Quran, if you read the Quran, uh, verse 55, um, uh, Verse 66, 66 to 69 uh, at the Surah 55, you will notice in both of them gardens are two spring sprouting. In both of them are fruits and palm trees and pomegranates. You also notice that Leongo just opposes the mention of pomegranate between God swearing God swearing and the fruits of paradise. On, pay, on stanza 12, he says, I swear by God, the incomparable, I shall speak the truth about the pomegranate. I swear, I have not seen, no, have I witness the fruits of paradise, such as those of Mwanamanga. This indicates that the choice of pomegranate is deliberately linked to heavenly scent. Once one applies the pleasant fragrance from maca or manga, he or she is purifying for the male or female body in order to attain heavenly or heavenly scent or paradise. More signs of heavenly connection are expressed by the recurrence of toponym maca. Toponym Maka appears in, and also toponym Safina, and also these also connect the two, the two, the two sets. And when we look at one of the Leongo's uh, description of, of her wife's armpit, he says, better, it is better than wild jasmine or pleasant fragrance of oil from manga Arab. So there are three connection here. There is jasmine, there is a fragrance, pleasant fragrance, and manga, manga Arab. So all this connected. So this connection should not be taken for granted. It's the connection that uh, shows that there is a body, there is a spirit, also there is a issue of purifications of body and spirit. And Talking of of using um, using sense or heavenly scent is also a duty a duty of a of a of a human being who aspire to go to heaven. Let me let me end up by by showing one of the intricate stanza by Mwana Kupona at standard 35. A thing that goes in and out, 
she told her daughter kitu changalie sana kitokacho na kuingia this is a is a point which has has missed a number of critics and i would like to to call upon other critics to look again at this particular stanza and so far i have my 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 interpretation of this but i would like to pause i mean i would like to uh, to pause it for now and finally uh, conclude my my my, my topic um by saying that both poets Manakupona and uh, uh, Fumuliongo invite readers to imagine and in some instances gaze at sexual encounters between between Liongo and his lover in order to Manamanga and also Manakupona and his and her husband. But uh, Liongo surrendered to the winds of a woman's seductive sense in their bodily encounter. Manakupona has instructed her daughter to purify and sent her husband and sent her husband and herself in order not only to fulfill marital obligation, but also to go to heaven. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very, very much, Dr. Uh, Ahmed. That was amazing, that was excellent. So we now have to reread um, the, these poems and I'm really looking forward to the discussion later. There's a lot to think about that you've given us here today. Um, um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of, 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 of perfumes purifying us for the spiritual world. That's just fascinating. But let's just go on to the third speaker. And this is Francisca Fay, who will be talking about Ufeminia, translating feminist politics in Tanzania. Karibu, Franzi. Thank you so much, Ida. Thank you, Angelica, for having me. I'm trying to share my screen as well. Let me see. Can't I can't currently see the presentation. Um, let me see if this one able to share it now, not yet. Okay. I think you have to be allowed to um, Angelica, I like uh, um, um yes, we just have to make you co-host in order to screen. So just one second. Okay, thanks so much. That's great. Um, yes, um, Aki, if you could just make Francisca co-host, that'd be great. Thank you. Hey, um, you. You should be able to share it without being a co-host. Just click on your share screen button. I've, I've enabled it for panelists. Yes. So Francisca, you should try to do share screen. I'm, I'm trying, it's not currently showing yet. Hang on. Um, hmm. That's strange because you are co-host. Give me one moment, please. Okay, so is it like while this is uh, while we're trying to figure this out, just for the audience, um, you you are not visible now. Uh, we're only seeing the presenters. But um, if you have a question and you raise your hand later during Q and A, then you can put on your video and speak, and we will hear and see you. So for those who have questions, um, you have the, the, the ability to, to do that. But Francisca is ready now. You're welcome, Asante Sana. Ooh, give you tone shoes. Thank you very <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for bearing with me here. Um, all right, uh, I hope you can all hear me well. And yeah, similarly point out if, if there's any technical glitches. Uh, thanks again for having me. So yeah, as you said, Ida, it's really lovely to come back to SOAS, even if it's virtually. Um, and I'll point out first, I'm not a linguist. I'm an anthropologist who came to anthropology by, by way of a brief stint in Swahili linguistics. So please bear that in mind. So when I speak about translation today, I want to understand it beyond a literal sense and uh, also metaphorically in terms of the often political practice of carrying things across uh, from one place to another. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. 
I'm uh, joining Jalul's call for uh, your comments and feedback and for contacting me um, because this is a, a set of very new ideas that I've been dwelling on only recently. So um, these are very much in the in the, in the embryonic stages of, of being developed and thought about from lots of different perspectives. And I'll appreciate all kinds of feedback on this. So please do get in touch. And I also apologize for my voice. I woke up with a cold, so um, I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, so central to the question that I um, that I, to, the, to the set of questions that I'm currently thinking about is the question of how to translate feminist politics in Tanzania and its global relations, and how to think closely with language and translation, such as with ideas of feminism and ufeminia, and what they can add to that. I'm interested in questions uh, of the role of language and translation as anthropological tools within politics and for liberation, and in the context of global flows of political discourses on analytical lenses such as feminism. Uh, in, in Swahili speaking contexts, uh, such as Tanzania and across its mainland and its isles. And some of the questions I'm interested in are, what are people talking about when they speak about ufeminia? How as anthropologists can we speak about feminism or feminist politics in a manner that grasps the many um, different varieties in which it is discussed in present day Tanzania? How can we make this endeavor decidedly decolonial and anti-racist? What can thinking with the practice of translation, and here I draw specifically on feminist linguistic anthropology and close attention to the Swahili language, bring to a deeper understanding of feminist politics around the world. So what I'll do um, over the next 20 minutes is to give you some background and context to my current interest in these questions. I'll think about how and where we can observe feminist politics being discussed and negotiated in contemporary Tanzania. I'll say something about why I think it's important to think about and how we translate questions of feminism in different contexts and about how we can possibly speak to negotiations of feminist politics by centering language and translation and more specifically their relations. So this April, um, I started a new position in political anthropology at the University of Mainz in Germany, and in the process of that, have begun to develop this new research project. And this is um, was just about two weeks after President Samia Suluhu was sworn in as the new and first female Muslim Zanzibar president of Tanzania, and currently the only female political head of state in Africa. And it became the news surrounding this change in power that shaped my orientation in thinking toward a new project. Now, while President Samia Sulu soon started assuring those in doubt that, as she said, I remember well walking past the Baraza in Jaws Corner in Zanzibar a few years earlier and listening into a conversation about the then ongoing US elections and a man saying to his conversation partner, that Trump would still be better than Clinton because the very worst case scenario would mean to be ruled by a woman. So now there she was, and I hope those guys have come to terms with that, but what caught my attention throughout these months of political change were in simple sexist oppositions toward women in leadership positions, but rather the discussions that were happening among Tanzanians themselves. In March, shortly after being sworn in, for example, people across Tanzania started debating President Samia's title. While some people were convinced that calling her Mama Samia instead of President or Rais was derogatory to her presidential powers and reduced her as a woman to the role of motherhood, others like um, Deutsche Welle Swahili journalist Grace Kabogo, for example, defended that in the title of Mama, there was nothing anti-feminist, but instead a lot of honor and respect. A few weeks later in April, Dar es Salaam based uh, journalist Khalifa Said asked whether Tanzania, despite now having a female president, also had a feminist president. And if President Suluhu would indeed advance gender equality and break with the former president Magufuli's open contempt for women, which included among many other matters, his announcement of a ban on pregnant girls attending schools, which um, as I'm sure you're all aware, are currently discussed across social media on an everyday basis. And by the end of August, the debate continued with President Samia Sorry, with President um, 
with President Samia being criticized uh, by Tanzanian politicians and citizens alike who questioned the whereabouts of women's rights in the country in response to her commenting on the flat chestedness of the Tanzanian women's football team, which according to her made marriage nothing but a dream to the players. Now, it's not President Samia Suluhu that I'm interested in, but it is instead the debates that have come to be discussed more loudly recently by means of her example. It's the nuances and the contradictions in these examples of publicly debated questions of feminist matters, sexism and women's rights as they are currently on the table and as they of course have already been discussed in Tanzania for decades. So thinking with these initial observations from newspapers and social media, this August I had the chance to spend a few weeks in Dar es Salaam, Bagamoyo, Zanzibar town and in Pemba, where I could follow this trail and explore more perspectives on the ground. I spent those weeks connecting with people who other long-standing contacts, friends and former research collaborators pointed out to me and who sometimes also referred to themselves as feminists, women's rights activists or gender advocates. Often these women were in roles that were anchored in the domain of public speech, which as Mary Beard puts it um, nicely, used to be, um, quote, the defining attribute of maleness. They were journalists or lawyers who worked with long established organizations like TAMWA, the Tanzania Media Women's Association, or TAULA, the Tanzanian Women Lawyers Association, or with organizations who were embedded in international development, like, for example, the Coalition for Women's Human Rights Defenders. Plenty of others um, worked in the art industry and positioned themselves very consciously outside of the aforementioned spaces in which the pressures or expectations to work within the confines of certain translations of feminism were often perceived as difficult to escape. And as a side note here, the historical figures that reoccurred throughout these conversations that were commemorated in speech and institutionalized cultural heritage formed a red line of the women associated with power and transgression, included people such as Princess Salma of Zanzibar, K. Emily Rutte, Siti Binti Saad, Biki Dude, um, Lucy Lamek, Bibi Titi Mohammed, uh, as a conversation partner asserted, Mwanamke wa Kwanza, Kupinga wa Ngereza, wa Stawale Nchi, Amisaidia na Uhuru wa Tanganyika, female chiefs or kings like Mwami Teresa Antare, or much lesser known and discussed figures like Maria Ernestina and famous business women in Kungwis like Manamakuka or Buguza. They were strong leaders, Lakini Suriayao Haiyan Dikwa, as another person I spoke to stressed. Now, taking as a starting point that questions of feminism and gender equality are presently anew on the table in Tanzania, I'll now turn to some ethnographic examples from the conversations I had in the field, which show the importance of attending to the discourses and from where I hope to think about concepts and theories that they may speak to helpfully for the context of Tanzania. In her book uh, from 2017, Living a Feminist Life, feminist theorist Sarah Ahmed writes, what do you hear when you hear the word feminism? It is a word that fills me with hope, with energy. It means to me how we pick each other up. Now this positive association of hearing the word feminist was not what I commonly encountered in the conversations I had across Tanzania. Here often upon hearing the word feminism and especially asking about it as a white non-African woman, the reaction was usually hesitant, sometimes negative at first. So in the reverse of Ahmed's definition of feminism as picking each other up, feminism or what the concept was understood to mean was often um, rather connotated with a sense of putting each other down and specifically in regard to the re relational situation between Western and African feminisms and what they were understood to represent. One self-identified feminist community member, Mwana um, Jumuia uh, um, as she called herself, explained, Tafsiri za harakati za ufeminia imeathiri wa sana na miradi ya wafadhili. The UN agenda of women's rights started that. And as she continued to explain, because Sauti za Afrika sana has yandikwa na hapa Afrika, she considered it important work to raise awareness about women's roles in history. She confirmed, Kazietu ni kufumbua macho, kuonyesha kwamba wanaake wamefanya vitu lakini vinapotea. And as part of that, 
And in order to avoid reprodu reproducing what she called professional translations that were brought here, and to instead support what she called kuzaliwa maarifa tofauti and wanawake ufeminia nje ya mainstream, she considered it to be particularly relevant kuvunja maneno makubwa kugusa maisha ya kila siku na kwa lugha ya kawaida kabisa. And to do this by means of kutafsiri wanawake wanachuambia katika lugha za sanaa. But this approach with a focus on other um, ways of speaking and knowledge making, unfortunately, and so she concluded, still attractive, Kwadona Yoyote. And it then falls into the small bubble of culture, Nahawa Toi Pesa Yamana Kwahi. Even though these programs usually ulikata migu kabla ya kwanza, she asserted that Lakini Sisi tunakata kushindwa. The variety of issues this conversation touched on was reflected throughout the other conversations I had. We don't own our own history. It's not known. Young women in Tanzania cannot take pride in what is theirs because they don't know their own history. What is it that is ours? Was a question another feminist journal journalist formulated in a conversation. And she too pointed to the need to work more with, on and through expressions of art and material culture, drawing on the example of the Kanga and explaining in a culture of silence like ours, you speak through that. The question of who wrote and who is writing whose history was one I encountered almost everywhere. Another feminist art worker expressed and suggested it important to ask, to increase the multitude of voices currently represented in, for example, institutionalized spaces of history and commemoration. Another journalist I spoke with explained, feminism kamadhana haijaeleweka kwa watu wengi. For her, it was particularly the role of religion that she emphasized as a critical field for women's rights activism. Maswala ya dini ni kubwa. Viongozi vya dini vina nafasi kubwa katika jamii. Mauhti kwa mfano hawapewi nafasi ya kuandika vitabu au kuongea katika radio, which according to her needed to change. And a women's rights activist who was more embedded within it and enthusiastic about international development discourses of feminism explained that it was important kwa wanawake kutetea haki za wanawake and named examples such as against sexual violence, harassment, bullying, ukeketaji, and legal support. She emphasized we need awareness raising. Mambo ya feminism haya elewi. Kama issues nigine ya kisiasa. Inabidi watu waelewe mambo ya feminism. Inaangaliwa negative. Kama ni kuharibu nyumba. Tukelezea vizuri kwenye jamii hii negative haito kuwepo. Ni swala pana na especially issues ya intersectionality haya elewa ni padia feminism. Taking this further, another act, um, activist art worker explained that feminism as a Western concept, according to her, is often understood as meaning that for women to achieve equality, they need to be more like men. But here, women are more accepting that women have different roles to men, and they are still very progressive. For her, it was an essential aim of women's rights activism that monamuke ajitambue, halafu ataweza kujitetea na kujilinda wenyewe. And this notion of to defend kutetea or to, to defend oneself kujitetea frequently reappeared across similar statements. The, family, the feminist journalist I mentioned earlier used it in a, in a um, resembling manner when she stated, tumeonewa, tutetea hakizetu. Some other contextually relevant questions that another journalist summed up included, Monamke kuwa jasiri, haki ya kumiliki rasilimali, idadi ya watoto angapi, women not being able to buy land, umri ya kuolewa. As among what she called, swalietu kwa kifeminia ki Afrika. And concluded that ufeminia wa bara la ulaya, ni tofauti na ufeminia na bara la Afrika. Discourses ni tofauti kabisa, maisha ni tofauti, the dhana can't be compared. So what united the positions of people I spoke with were the understanding that in Tanzania, ufeminia should be understood in its own right with specific, with specific emphasis on local women's matters and the discourses that frame them with attention to ideas of alternative knowledge production and the notion of self-defense and that it should be modeled, uh, that it should not be modeled after feminisms of the West. 
And it's here where I want to think about these critiques and perspectives with translation. So many of the views on feminism and feminist political action I encountered were anchored in a critique of an uncrit uncritical translation or carrying across of Western feminisms, or what Françoise Vergès calls civilizational feminism, that borrows the vocabulary of the colonial civilizing mission. So if we understand, and this is uh, Gayatri Spirak in 1993, as she says, a simple miming of the responsibility to, tra uh, to the trace of the other in the self as one of the seductions of translating, then the number of actors who had given in to that seduction is at the heart of, of what many of my conversation partners considered as problematic. So for the Tanzanian context, Demere Kitonga and Marjorie Mbilini describe this similarly when they criticize Western feminism as a type of liberal feminism, as they say, quote, whose gaze is focused on the other and in which Western feminists assume that African women are passive objects who are acted upon by men or patriarchy without paying attention to examples of contestation, resistance and struggle because the observer adopts the patronizing position of knowing what is best for the African woman. Western feminism, Kitunga and Mbilini assert, has been adopted by many African women scholars and governments and government officials parliamentarians and NGO-based actors working in Africa, as well as African feminists based in the North. And here it's particularly their nuanced attention to the diversity within categories such as Tanzania or Tanzanian itself of, um, or African feminism that I believe we need to pay more attention to. So if translation implies, as Rita Kothari suggests, the simultaneous possibilities of closure and openness, then um, my conversation partner's suggestions of re rewriting this history may pose such an openness and counter the perceived closure felt in the absence of it. And I suggest that some aspects that um, might aid to this are a departure from local theoretical productions that already do and have been doing that, and be a centering of language and translation in the endeavor to think with other concepts and ideas than those promoted exclusively within feminist discourses of development. Again, for Tanzania specifically, this could mean departing from Kitunga's and Mbilini's conceptual framework of transformative feminism, which as they state challenges patriarchy, neoliberal and other intersecting forms of oppression and unequal power relations, and which is built on the vision of a transformed Tanzanian society characterized by gender equality, equity, empowered women and social justice. And most interestingly, uh, Kitunga and Mbilini Note as well that they have recognized silences within transformative feminism in Tanzania, which may ultimately undermine the struggle for change. And they state these silences in order to encourage further thinking and to provoke debate, as including the following and echoing some of um, what my conversations part, conversation partner stated. Um, so sexual orientation, identity, sexuality, or the role of men in the feminist movements are some of those examples. Another free, uh, theoretical framework I find helpful in thinking with these questions is the introduction to gender studies from 2019 by Sara uh, Mwakyambiki, which presents a more recent take that continues to echo the above points in her framing of African feminism. She writes, African feminism is the study of women oppression in Africa. The study has two agendas. One, we as African feminists must uh, have their own way of describing women oppression different from Western feminism. The second agenda is to create African knowledge that would empower women in their struggle for liberation in the context. She argues further that as she says, for many third world feminists, gender and discrimination are not viewed as sole or even the main source of women oppression. Third world feminists often see their main struggle as being alongside their men, community against racism, economic exploitation and poverty. And she continues that also in many African languages, gender is not linguistically coded, although seniority is linguistically marked, absence of gender and language, according to her, shows the relative non-importance of sex-based difference. And from this perspective, even in Kiswahili, um, language words like gender or patriarchy, as she points out, naturally, were not there until recently when the Kiswahili Council was given a task to translate the same. Um, for example, patriarchy to mfumodume or gender to jinsia. 
This, she concludes, has led uh, for many African women to not identify themselves with feminist, even if they are actively working for women. And in some form, Wakiambiki, the objective of Africa feminism is to take control over debates of women oppression in Africa. So it's, it's a, a decidedly discursive matter. Um, finally, I believe uh, an attempt to grasp these negotiations needs to consider language and translation um, more closely. So if we look, for example, at the example of the Charter of Feminist Principles for African Feminists, which was published in 2007 after the African Feminist Forum in 2006, I uh, want to suggest that the multiplicity and the nuance that is inherent in the Swahili translation of the central terms throughout this document can serve as a line of signposts in terms of which, uh, which routes to follow. So instead of um, the more general English title, the Swahili version is called Mkataba wa Kanuni za Ukombozi wa Wanawake Kimapinduzi kwa Wanaharakati wa Kiafrika, which literally translates not simply to principles or African feminists, but instead to the Charter of Regulations of Liberation of Revolution, women of revolutionary women, women for African activists. So we have three key concepts, liberation, revolution, and activism that are named already in the title, but that remain encompassed by the more general terms in the English. Further along the charter statement that um, the African Feminist Forum is an independent feminist platform is then translated as African Feminist Forum haki. So here we, we re-encounter the promotion of kutetea, defending in the context of women's rights, a translation that is more directly understanding of feminist practice as human rights work and narrowing it down to that. This is then reinforced when sharing feminist knowledge is translated as kubadilishana marifa kusu haki now, as Ingrid Palmari has pointed out, issues of translation have and could figure in feminist praxis in ways that further our thinking about language and its connections to power. And this is what I suggest is helpful to think with here that the translational choices and differences as they occur are on the one hand reproducing a certain politicized understanding of feminisms and women's rights work, but also that on the other hand, that if we attend to them seriously, these nuances might open up spaces to think with ideas of revolution and liberation as they may be less uh, frequently used within development agendas. Ultimately, this echoes Palmer's suggestion that moments of translation difficulty give us an opportunity to understand how a, ph a phenomenon, for example, gender inequality, as she writes, might be produced differently in different contexts and what conditions lead to this differentiation a differential production. So let me end with the hope that a lot of what anthropology can do to contribute to decolonization generally and in regard to the understanding of its relations um, between different feminisms is to think with and along the lines of translation and that such sensitive translation may contribute to a deeper understanding of feminist theory making in Tanzania and across the world. By refusing to rely on ideological framings of comparison as the basis of translation, paying attention to translation's refusals and dissonance, as suggested by Thayer, may, may serve as a strategic political act in the hands of social movements, and as I conclude also to understand them across different contexts. Finally, which concepts and ideas are at the heart of this understanding, whether that be ufeminia, wanaharakati wa ukombozi wa wanawake kimapinduzi, kuditetea, or ulingo wa usawa kidinsia, remains to be explored. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Fran Fran Francisca. That was just amazing. Asante sana. When you were talking about uh, language and power, mm -hmm. and I was thinking of, of those citations, <laughs> that you had like for mm. example vana can't be compared i thought mm. okay we have a lot to, to probably go through as well that was amazing and also um you know issues like uh flat-chested footballers and mm. mama samia kuwa mama we can, we can we can talk about this later when we have time that mm. was just good. asante sana Asante. Our, <laughs> asante. so our next um speaker oh yes here i have it is um rachel maina be rachel maina um, who's, who's, who's going to speak about a relevance theoretic analysis of metaphor in Utendi wa Mwanamanga. Mwanamanga seems to be quite um, uh, present today. Asante sana.
Yes, I'm mean, Karibu, Rachel. You, you can start now. Are you muted? Poleni, I. Well, you muted. Okay. I well, was. That's the beauty yeah. of Zoom, isn't it? <laughs> Karibu sana. Asante na sahau kutumia Zoom. Tulikuwa tumezoea, lakini sasa mambo ya mebadilika. My name is Rachel, like Aida said. I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So it's uh, going to early morning in uh, the Midwest. And I have to have this. Uh, light, which is kind of bothering my eyes, but we can do this. Um, I have to say this, I am not Swahili, neither am I Muslim. I'm just an outsider looking in. Um, Swahili is my second language. English is my third language, so you will forgive my accented uh, English. And maybe when I do talk Swahili, it won't also be uh, native. Um, let me see how this goes. I'm trying to move this then. Okay. So I'll be talking about erotic uh, Swahili poetry and uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad Kipacha. You've already introduced my topic and um, this is where I say Asha Kumsi Matusi because I'll be talking about things that I would not ordinarily speak about in public, but they're there and we have to discuss them. So I'm looking at Utendi Wamwana Manga, uh, which is you know attributed to Fumo Diongo, a renowned warrior poet of the Swahili. The Kokomo also claim him, but I'll talk of him as a Swahili. And um Tendi or Tenzi are, uh, you know, like the epics of Swahili literature, they are lengthy narratives in verse form, and they mainly focus on history and religion. So this um, Utendi wa Mwana Manga, because it's erotic, is incredibly uh, secular. So yeah, that's why I say the Shakum Simatusi. Um, I will not talk about Liongo uh, because much, has been said about him and there's a lot that we don't know about him. But in this uh, uh, poem, Liongo describes his wife's body from head to toe and such a description goes against Islamic beliefs. So he uses figures of speech to sketch his wife's body. In this case, I will not look at any other figures of, uh, of speech, sorry. I just look at metaphors, but it is a very rich poem in terms of figurative speech. I will not be very technical, but I'm using relevance theory as proposed by Speber and Wilson. And, um, you know, it talks about meaning, how you recover meaning of an utterance. And you don't just look at the word as it, as it is or a phrase as it is. Then you have to also uh -huh. think about other things such as the textual context the social context and the speaker's intention. In this case, uh, the textual context is the poem itself. The social uh, context is the Waswahili and their culture, their religion and so on. And the speaker in this case is uh, Liongo. I will talk about ad hoc concepts. So this is a concept that differs from the usual meaning of the word. It is used to uh, talk about meaning change in context. So it is just an occasion specific sense in a particular uh, usage. That said, I'm done with relevance theory, uh, though I will go back to it here and there. So Swahili so customs and traditions do not allow public talk about sexual relations. So whenever poets want to talk about such, they use figurative language and riddles. And only then can they be performed in the public arena. So that's why Liongo uses figurative language to describe his wife's body. Well, 
we could always call him or call her a lover, but I, I want to think about a wife because that's what um, would work um, in uh, the setting that I am addressing. So he describes his wife's body and alludes to sexual relations. And this uh, heavy figurative language masks the intended organs as well as the actions and therefore takes care of the society's boundaries, you know? And there's a concept of ara, I don't know where, whether I'm pronouncing it the right way, and these are the private parts of, and when I say private parts, I'm not just talking of genitalia, uh, private parts of men and women, we should always be covered up, as well as personal space. It's the boundary that separates the personal and public space. In most cases, because there are various interpretations to this, a woman's aura is her whole body, excluding the face, hands, and legs. So in some cases, in some interpretations, it will also include the hands and the legs and maybe the face as well. So I will not read the verses that I'm um, analyzing, maybe the first one, because I don't know about time, if there's time towards the end, maybe I could do that. But uh, verse eight, for example, and I'm, using um, the poem as it was, you know, published by the Diongo Working Group, working under the auspices of uh, Tuki in 2006. So there are many, many versions of this uh, poem. And in this version, verse eight says, Takwanda kitwani nduza sikiani, harili laini, so in this verse, Diongo describes his wife's hair as soft silk. Well, it's said that he had many liaisons with women, but already uh, in verse six and seven, which is the context, the textual context, he has already identified the woman in question as the lady from manga. And the Swahili used manga for Arabia. So when Biongo says her hair is soft silk, Harili Laini, the context helps the audience decode the utterance. They can tell what he's talking about. Then verse 22, um, Liongo says Monamanga's mouth gives out the sweet scent of Mkandi. And Mkandi is a shrub that is common at the, uh, the uh, coast of East Africa and the Swahili use it for scant or scent. And, um, you know, it's popular, especially during weddings. While in some Asian communities, the mkadi has culinary uses. Among the Swahili, is usually used for decorative fragrance. And therefore, when Liongo uses um, the term mkandi, then uh, the audience can easily in the meaning, they know that in this case, in the, among the Swahili, it's not used for food. Well, um, they thought that Manamanga's breath smells of mukadi because she probably ate some food spiced with its aroma is discarded because it's among the Swahili and it's normally um, used to for decorative fragrance. So in this case, this is a case of semantic loosening and the aroma of the mukad is now used to describe anything that is sweet smelling or fragrant, such as, you know, Manamanga's mouth. Then verse 32, and the, uh, Dr. Kipacha already talked about this. So Liongo swears to speak the truth about pomegranate. And the same is extended to verse 33 where he swears he has never witnessed fruits of paradise, such as Monamanga, Monamangas. According to Napa 1979, pomegranates are considered fruits of paradise in Islam. They are one of the many rewards awaiting believers in paradise. Because 
uh, the Swahili are Muslim, this will be part of the encyclopedic entries about the concept of pomegranates. And um, in this case, uh, the, we can see the fruit, the shape is round, just like a breast. There are claims that this fruit is an aphrodisiac, a proposition that is further encouraged by Liongo's utterance in the verse, the verse 33. Um, and he says, mm -hmm. when clothes cover them, the pomegranate fascinate the eyes. When they are laid bare, the mind wanders. So in this case, um, he's talking about, you know, being uh, together with his wife in their space, their private space. Then uh, verse 41 to verse 48, Biongo talks of Mwanamanga's sexual organs. Well, even breasts are sexual organs, but in this case, it, gets, it delves deeper and alludes to sexual activity. In verse 41, he talks of Mwanamanga's sailing ship, which he saw was neither long nor wide but war filled among the dyes. Well, the Swahili live along the coast. It's a well-known fact. And they have had uh, vibrant marine life over the ages. So of course, the encyclopedic assumptions associated with the concept of sailing ship, you wouldn't ordinarily think of the sailing ship when you're thinking about the human body. So this is not adequate for the audience to interpret this metaphor. So it must acquire ad hoc property, content, context specific sense, which is then metaphorically interpreted to mean um, Manamanga's private parts or genitalia. In this case, I trying to not to use, you know, um, explicit language in this case. Um, Last 45, Liongo says he went to the barge uh, to check the water level and having checked it, he found it was not leaking. So the bilge. And um, Napat explains that old ships usually have a residue of dirty water, you know, that will not be cleaned out even with bailing efforts. Well, I've included an image of barge water in the Oren sailing ships would probably have to scoop the water out. Well, a new ship will not have any built water. And the cultural context of the Swahili way of life uh, comes to play where virginity is highly valued among the Swahili. And the audience has already interpreted that the bulge is Mwanamanga's private part because it's already been alluded to in uh, verse 41. And armed with this knowledge, together with the uh, cultural context, then the proposition that Yongo is claiming that Wanamanga is a virgin acquires optimal relevance. So that is the meaning that, you know, after inference, after processing, that is the meaning that, uh, you know, the audience ends up with. Then, Verse 46, and uh, Dr. Kipacha talked about this. Priyongo says he went to the barge to look at the water level. And when he came to the shore, he fired a cannon. Well, having established that, you know, Liongo is talking about erotic, erotic activities in the previous utterances, then this context guides the audience in interpreting what firing a cannon mean? Well, I think by this time, um, the Swahili were already um, and, uh, having visitors and uh, the concept of cannon was already there with, with all the wars that were fought. And therefore, uh, it is already in the encyclopedic knowledge of the Swahili what a cannon is. So when um, Liongo talks about firing a cannon, then the meaning that he's talking about reaching 
sexual climax is easily um, accessed. I think I have enough time to read some of those verses. I don't know about that, Ida. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I want to read uh, uh, verse. I've already read verse eight, so I want to read verse twenty-two. You forgive me, my eyes are just giving me trouble. So kama huradidi nyoshi zamkadi au za zabadi yangawa na fungwa. And uh, I will still use the, um, okay, let me read verse 32. Na apa walahi asio shabihi tanena sahihi ya makomamanga. Na apa, na apa si wenepo si shuhudi yepo Matunda ya pepo ya, ya kwe manamanga, manamanga samahani. Kwa hivyo, um, like I said, uh, Napat has already uh, talked about pomegranates being the fruit of paradise. And this is alluded by uh, Liongo um, in this verse. Then verse 32, I need to access verse. I, okay, let me let me do Swahili. So I've read the Swahili. I probably read um, the English translation. I swear by God, the incomparable. I shall speak the truth about the pomegranate. I swear I have not seen, nor have I witnessed the fruits of paradise as those of Manamanga. Then verse 32. Project. or rather verse 41 to 48. <laughs> Nilipo yona sinire ipana iyalie nyonga. Kakundua ndume matanga ya kwime haswa lagalime shira kasonga. Kwalina mawingu na pepo nyengwangu zote zombo zangu kazi funga funga. Kazungua bao kapinga shikio weneo ya vutao mai enda manga ngamani kangia ili kufa, kutungia kisa kuzengea ngama isikwenga kangia ngamani kenda uziwani ni yepo pwani kapija mzinga na hapo that's where we were when i talked about verse 46 liongo alluding to reaching sexual climax by uh, the firing of a cannon. So I want to conclude by saying this. Well, like we said, you don't use explicit language in public among the Swahili. And um, I remember once trying to present this poem in a, on a, uh, in a Facebook uh, group and it was during Ramadan and one of the Ustadis, you know, 
suggested that we postpone, you know, and talk about it after Ramadan. So I understand that this is not something we would ordinarily speak about, but then sexual relations are a fact of life. And sometimes the poet will want to praise or to actually talk about feelings and so on. And when they want to do that, then they will have to use figurative speech. In this case, Liongo uses um, metaphors and similes and other figurative language to describe his wife's body and their sexual relations. And when an audience seeks to interpret this, they will have to search for meaning in the given utterance, either relying on the textual context, the social context, or in some cases as well, they might, they might have to use ad hoc uh, concepts to come up with the meaning. So once they reach an interpretation that corresponds with the expectation of relevance, which is what relevance theory claims, then they will stop processing. They will have acquired the meaning. Then the context of the utterance will guide them towards optimal relevance. I've already talked about uh, context and I've already talked about the assumptions. So thank you. It's been an honor. Wow, thank you very much. Am I echoing? No, okay. No, thank you very much, Rachel. That was that was amazing. Asante sana. I was interesting. Uh, I was interested to see them kadi, because mm -hmm. I know in Zanzibar we use it to make vikuba during mm -hmm. wedding, mm -hmm. and so we can probably talk about all this later uh, during the QA. Uh, we now have ten minutes um, where we'll have Omar Kibulanga, and he'll be presenting a video or talking about his video, sort of like a recording of the biography of Habib Swale from Lamu. Thank you very much. Uh, Omar Karibusan. Nam. Mimi sim semaji. Lakini leo na sema. Si kwamba napenda kusema sema, lakini na chilea kusemwa. Kwamba lipo na kusema, si kusema. Kwa hivyo, nasema uh, wenyeji wetu uh, chuo kikuu cha SOAS pamoja na wasomi, wazungumzaji wenzangu na wotu waliohudhuria mabibi na mabwana na tumai hamjamo. Kama mlivuambiwa jina langu ni Omar Kibulanga. Na mimi leo niko hapa kwa ajili ni metengeneza filamu ambao inaitwa Tete Series Episode 1 inaoangazia wasifu wa Habib Swale. Naomba kuweza ku share screen. Natumai tuko pamoja. Tete series episode 1 wasifu wa Habib Swale ameweza kutayarishwa na mimi Omar Kibulanga. Tete series ni nini? Tete series ni msururu wa filamu kuhusu wanaume na wanawake wa kipekee kutoka mwambao wa Afrika ya Mashariki. Tete series episode 1 ndo nimeanaimba Habari ni msomi na mwanamageuzi wa kipekee aliweza kuishi katika miaka ya 1800 alizaliwa Komoro na akaweza kuhamia Lamu akawa mtu mkubwa aliyefanya mageuzi makubwa Kwa nini Tete series? Pengine swali la kwanza uh, ni hilo. Uh, hapa tulipo haswa leo kwamba tuzungumza na wasomi na wasomi vichwa vyao ni tofauti na vyetu basisi watu wa kawaida. Watu wa kawaida vichwa vimebeba nywele ama pengine upara peke yake. Lakini mimi napenda kusema kwamba vichwa vya wasomi vimebeba madini. Madini ili kunufaisha watu. Lakini kama wale wanichangulia walivyosema kuna wengi wametajwa kina maalim Yahya 
ina maalim shihab mukipenda shihab din shiraddin ni wasomi vigogo na mengi wameandika mazuri lakini je kwa dunia ya sasa tunawafikia wale walengwa mahusu mahususi nikisema walengwa waliokusudiwa hasa hapa ni vijana vijana ambao wako katika ulimwengu utandawazi na wengi katika tabia yao ya kusoma ama they have a poor reading culture kwa hivyo yale mengi yaliyohifadhiwa katika vitabu sasa muda umefika ili kuweza kuyanyambua na kuweza kuyaweka katika nyenzo ambayo itawavutia hawa vijana ili iweze kuendeleza ile historia na turathi zetu za Kiswahili na watu wetu waliofanya mambo makubwa kutoka maeneo ya mwambao wa Afrika Mashariki ama uswahilini kwa jumla ndio maana tukachukua fursa hii kuweza kutengeneza vitu ambavyo vitaweza kuvutia vijana na watu wa kizazi cha sasa pengine mnajiuliza tete siri basi mbona awamu moja episode moja ya habit swale kama mnavuniona ni kijana na uwezo wangu bado ni mdogo uh, wa kifedha na kusudia ndio maana tukaamua na leo diwani tutakata kuwa tutaunga wajihi lakini huko mbele Mungu akituwezesha zaidi safari itakuwa ndefu na itatimia kwa kwa kifupi tete series ni msururu wa filamu ambao unazungumzia wanaume na wanawake wa kipekee kutoka mambao wa Afrika Mashariki episode 1 nimeweza kumwangazia Habib Swale kwa nini Habib Swale sababu ni hili kwanza amefanya mambo makubwa tumeweza kuyagawanya kwa vigawanyo vitatu kigawanyo cha kwanza ni elimu elimu ukubwa wa Habib Swale uko wapi ni taasisi ya riadha katika miaka hiyo ya nyuma taasisi Habib Swale aliweza kuasisi taasisi ya riadha masomo yalikuwa yakizungu yakifundishwa ki informal setup kwamba watu ni sisi kwa sisi mimi baba nina elimu nafundisha mtoto wangu mtoto wangu afundisha mkuu wangu na inaenda kihivyo yeye yeah, akaweza kuleta mfumo wa taasisi hapana tutajenga shule ambayo inaitwa riadha islamic center riadha mosque and islamic center iko mpaka sasa salama ili kuweza kukaribisha wanafunzi kutoka kila sehemu na watu pia wanasoma kimfumo kuna madarasa mtu akitoka awamu hii anaenda awamu nyingine kwa hivyo kimimi nilitizama nikaona ni jambo kubwa sana ambalo liweza kuletwa na Habib Swale pili akaleta elimu mlango wazi hapa na maanisha open door policy elimu wakati huo ilikuwa inanasibishwa sana na sehemu kama lamu ilikuwa ni kitovu cha elimu lakini watu walikuwa kifundishana sisi kwa sisi kulikuwa na ubaguzi wa jinsi ya kusambaza elimu mtu alieleta mageuzi ama mapinduzi ya elimu ni Habib Swale akaweza kuleta open door policy kwamba namkaribisha yeyote anayetaka kusoma watu wa matabaka duni watu wa makabila mbalimbali mbali, watu ambao zama zile wakijulikana pengine family fulani kazi yao ni kujenga family fulani kazi yao ni ukulima kika sema la hasha hao wote wana haki ya kupata elimu ili hayo yote wanayoyafanya waweze kuyafanya kwa desturi nzuri zaidi na elimu hii ni elimu gani ni elimu ya kuishi na watu vizuri elimu ya kuweza kujua mola kuweza kujua mafunzo ya kidini kuweza kujua namna ya kutangamana na watu tatu akaweza kupeleka walimu vitongojini nafikiri kwa sasa vinaweza kuonekana vitu vya kawaida kidogo lakini kwa miaka ya nyuma kizungumzia 1800s mtu aliyekuja na mawazo ya kufikiria kuwa kuna haja ya dharura tuweze kupeleka walimu katika vitongoji mimi ni kolamu lakini naweza kupeleka watu Tana River watu wa Kodoni pengine hawajijua mambo ya elimu hakujaendelea hakuja starabika tupeleke walimu waweze kuwafundisha waweze kuwapa moyo waweze kuwakonektisha na jamii za kimijini vile vile kupeleka watu mpaka Vanga sehemu za mpaka Uganda kuvuka mipaka na kwenda mpaka Somalia nafikiri ni mtu ambaye aliweza kufanya kazi kubwa zaidi kwa uwezo mdogo wakati ule na dunia ilikuwa bado imefungika fungika vile vile akaweza kuwahawilisha wanafunzi kimasomo yani kufanya exchange programs nafikiri kwa wakati ule ni kitu kikubwa exchange programs wengi wetu tumeweza kujua hivi karibuni lakini wakati ule Habib Swale aliweza kuleta uhusiano wa kipekee na taasisi na maeneo mbalimbali. 
kwa mfano Mombasa. Mombasa ni mji mkubwa wakati ule ataweza kuiconnectisha na Lamu. Wanafunzi kawa wanatoka Lamu wanakuja Mombasa in terms of uh, mambo ya exchange program kujifundisha huko watu wanafundishwa kimfumo gani na kule watu wanakuja watu wanatoka wanakwenda Zanzibar mbali na Zanzibar wakavuka mipaka watu wamekwenda mpaka Tarim watu wameenda Seyun hizi ni sehemu za Hadramaut Yemen ili kuleta ule mjumuiko ama utangamano wa kimasomo bila shaka hayo ni mambo makubwa ambayo yapo katika filamu yangu ya jisaji moja ambayo imeweza ku kuangazia swala la elimu mbali na elimu Uh, ni science. Habib Swali aliweza kuangazia masuala ya sayansi ili kuhakikisha watu wanaishi katika afya bora. Vipi? Tiba asili. Ni mtu ambaye alijifundisha na akaweza kujua mambo ya tiba asili na dawa za kienyeji na akawa anazifanya ili kutibu watu. Maana yeye mwenyewe alikuja kutoka Komoro kwanza akutibiwa miguu yake ilikuwa na matatizo alafu akaweza katibiwa na yeye akajifundisha na yeye kama anatibu watu na anaeleza kila anayemfundisha elimu ya dini dunia anamfundisha na tiba na wao wanaizidi kuisambaza na pale msikitini ikawa msikiti si mahali tu pa kuweza eh, kuswali na watu kwenda zao hapana ni mahali ambapo watu wakiwa na maradhi yao na na kichwa anakuja anamweleza kuna maradhi kama haya unaweza kutumia tiba hii kachukue mnuka uvundo kachukue yasi kachukue maranaha kachukue mbono kachukue fanya hivi utanganye na hivi ili kuweza kuleta afya bora katika umma Mbali na hivyo Habib Swali aliweza kuzungumzia masuala ama kuangazia masuala ya desturi na utamaduni vipi aliweza kuwastaarabisha wagema watumwa na wanyonge Wagema ni watu ambao katika hali ya kawaida kwenye jamii zetu ni watu wanadharaulika watu ambao amelewa mtu ayuko katika hisia zake lakini Habib Swali aliweza kujitoa na kuwastaarabisha na kuleta desturi nzuri kwamba ya kuweza kutangamana na watu wa kila namna wa kila kufu na kuweza kuwaleta karibu hata mwanzo alipokuwa akileta mageuzi haya kwa ajili watu wa miji walimpiga vita sana walikuwa kimkejeni hata ule msikiti ama ile center yake aloijenga ule msikiti wa Wagema kwa hivyo riadha wa mwanzo ilikuwa ikiitwa msikiti wa Wagema kwa ajili alikuwa akiwaleta karibu Wagema akizungumza nao akitoka nao mangweni akija nao akiwaambia ah sasa tushateza ngoma sasa tukae kuna na Mungu kuna na maisha kuna na familia vile vile akiweza kuwaleta karibu watumwa ama ex slaves wale watu walikuwa watumwa majamii zao zilikuwa za kitumwa walikuwa kidharaulika kabisa ye yeah, akawainua akiweza kuwapa elimu na kuweza kuwa pahadhi katika uh, jamii na wanyonge bali na hiyo akaweza kuleta uh, maulidi ni sherehe ambazo zimeweza kufana sana mpaka sasa uh, kila mwaka anafanyika maulidi ambayo ni sherehe za kuweza kusherekea mazazi ya mtume Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam lakini yake aliyefanya tofauti aliweza kuyaunganisha na utamaduni katika ile maulidi watu wanakuja wanacheza ngoma kama hao wagema wana ngoma yao maarufu kiitwa uta akiweza kuwakaribisha wakicheza nao watu wakijua kumbe mwezi huu ndo alizaliwa mtume na watu wakijua tamaduni mbalimbali watu walitoka mbali watu kutoka siu watu kutoka matondoni wakija na magoma yao magoma ya siu watu wakija na kila namna ya tamaduni waboni watu wa kutoka kila sehemu wa Somali wakija mpaka kumleta zawadi zao ile kama ni fimbo za kutembelea ni mikuki watu wakija na kila namna kwa hivyo ni mtu ambaye aliweza kuleta kubuni ule utamaduni na akaweza kufanya utangazike na kuweza kuwekea sherehe maalum ambayo mpaka sasa inaendelea miaka zaidi ya 80 baada ya kufa ni sherehe ambazo zinaendelea na bado ni zazidi kuwa kubwa na kubwa zaidi uh, mbali na hiyo kuna nyumba ya Habib Swale hii filamu tuliweza kwenda katika nyumba ya Habib Swale ambayo iko mpaka sasa ni nyumba ya jadi na karibu takriban Uh, karne moja sasa na imeweza uh, kuwa na vitu mbalimbali nafikiri baada hii uh, slide yangu ikiisha nitawaonesha video ndogo tu ya dakika tano ambayo itaweza kuonesha muftasari wa hiyo video nyumba Habib Swali imebeba vitu vingi ukisamahani okay, Omar uh, samahani Omar tuna, tuna kama dakika nne labda ungefanya fanya alafu kutonyesha video sawa sawa kwa hivyo nyumba ya Habib Swali mbali na hiyo katika nyumba yake utaona katika swala la mawasiliano utandawazi na utalii jinsi alivyokuwa akizungumza ama akiwasiliana na jamii za nje 
Mbali na hivyo uandishi wa hii filamu ya Habib Swale umeandika kishairi. Nafikiri mkiona katika video mtaweza kuiona uandishi ambao ni staili nimechukua katika kwetu swahilini. Watu zamani wakizungumza kitabu mabibi zetu kama ngonjera wakijibizana kishairi na mimi nimeweza kuiandika kishairi. Na mbali na hiyo kuna shairi la kipekee ambalo limeweza kutungwa na familia ya ushairi maarufu Lamu. Sasa wamefariki baba na mwanae wakiitwa Kadara. Wameandika babake na mwanae akaweza kulikariri liko katika uh, video hiyo. Lengo kuu la Tete Series na masuala ya Habib Swale ni kuzihifadhi na kuzileza historia na turathi zetu. Nafikiri bila kupoteza muda nitajaribu ku kushare video fupi ili muweze kui kuiona. Mradi Najaribu kushare video. Najaribu kushare video lakini inakataa ama niweke kwa screen. Unaweza ku um, kwa kawaida kama hapo kwenye kushare pale juu kuna kama share with voice au inakataa um Naona inakataa lakini wacha nijaribu kushare screen. Okay. Labda ifungue kwenye 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 computer yako alafu tuna kama dakika mbili. So meanwhile everybody those who have a, a question if you could just put your hand up so that we know you will be asking the, the first person to ask after Omar has shared his uh, video will be uh, Morgan. Sijui kama pengine mnaweza kuiona. Yeah, ndio tunaiona. Haina sauti. Ilibidi ushare na sauti sijui. Lai manani ndio takayo andia. Na ya pili rahmani na rahimu kwa ndamia. Na himdiki baini na sala kukhitimia. Ni kauli ya amini ya tumawe tukarima Habib Swale ni tete ni mtu mhashamu ambaye athari zake katika elimu, sayansi na utamaduni zimejipenyeza katika kanda ya Afrika Mashariki na kukita mizizi kikiki. Alizaliwa katika visiwa vya Ngazija kwenye miaka nane. lakini akahamia Lamu nchini Kenya akawa mgeni mashuhuri, jasiri kama Jemedari, aliyetia fura kilejendari. Filamu hii inaangazia baadhi ya michango ya kiongozi huyu wa kipekee kama inavyosimuliwa na vitukuu vyake. Habib Swale katika jamii tumtukua ni msomi, tumtukua ni tabibu, tumtukua ni mkiongozi, tumtukua ni mtu ambaye amekala watu kuzu. Na yote ya mjenga mwanadamu ya kamfanya ayonekane ni tafauti. Habib Swale alitia bidia mchwa ili kuchochea mabadiliko ya kimienendo na kuleta utandawazi katika jamii hii ya wahafidhina lakini kwa kuzingatia asili na fasili za wenyeji wenyewe alidhihirisha mchango wake katika uzalishaji na usambazaji elimu kwa kuisimamisha riadhwa moja wapo ya taasisi za awali za masomo ya juu katika kanda nzima ya Afrika ya Mashariki na ya Kati alituma wajumbe katika vitongoji mbalimbali nchini Kenya akali kwa wanafunzi kutoka nje na kuanzisha mfumo wa kuwahawilisha wanafunzi kimasomo katika maeneo tofauti na pia kimataifa his wisdom was greater than his knowledge na he was a great thinker change zote hizi zilizopatikana ni kwa sababu yake yeye bongo lake likuwa panufu sana alifanya taasisi ya riadha kulikuwa hakuna taasisi katika East Africa iwe ni taasisi ya kidini au ya secular kulikuwa hakuna university katika East Africa kulikuwa hakuna high school of learning 
whether secular or religious. Riyadh was the first one. Ukuonesha namna gani ilikuwa ile fikra yake. Ilikuwa pana zaidi. Kuliko wale watu wanaoka pale. Kuliko watu wa wakati wake. Habib Swale alifungua milango wazi na kuwasomesha walala hai na walala hoi licha kupata pingamizi kubwa kutoka kwa mabepari. Watu wakiona elimu haitowezekana asomeshwe kila mtu. Hata alipoanza kuijenga riadha na kukubali kupokea wanafundi mbalimbali mbali, makabila mbalimbali mbali, basi ilikuwa alipigwa zita kwa hakika pigo zita kwamba asomesha watu ambao kwamba si dharura wasome au wasomeshwe kuonekana kwamba kabila mbalimbali yamezikusanya lakini akaona elimu ni haki ya muislamu haitofaa kusomesha watu fulani na watu fulani tusosomeshe habib swali aliwenzi utabibu alirithi taaluma akaikamata na kuieneza kistadi sayansi hiyo ya mitishamba na tiba asili almuradi aburishi afya ya umma asasa almasjid ala taqwa aliusimamisha ule msikiti kwa sababu ya Mwenyezi Mungu ya mcha Mwenyezi Mungu fihi yustashfa min al adwa ndani yake alikifanya dawa kwa hivyo legacy yake hakuweka kwa msikiti uwe kando na maisha aliweka msikiti katika ku solve problem za watu na moja katika problem za watu ni kuketa for their well being na maradhi akaona kwamba yeye ni muhimu kama alipotibiwa yeye na yeye atibu watu atibu maradhi ya kiwiliwili na maradhi ya kiroho binadamu lazima awe na maisha mawili ruhani na jismani Aidha alihuisha utamaduni na ubunifu kwa kuanzisha shamra shamra za maulidi ya lamu yanayoendelea kuwavutia waumini kila mwaka kutoka kila kuna ili kutukuza kuzaliwa kwa mtume Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam kwa shangwe za kikale na kisasa na akaanza la habib salih kuweka maulidi yake na akaasisi msikiti huu tuonao hapa katika mwaka wa alfu, mia tatu na kumi ambao sasa una zaidi ya miaka 125 takriban Istoshe tulizuru nyumba ya Habib Swale na kushuhudia mabaki adimu na adhimu yanayofumbua uhodari wa wapwani katika usanifu ujenzi na uhunzi uchongaji na ushonaji kukandika na kadhalika nyumba ambayo ina karibu karne moja na nusu na imeweza kusimama hapa kama kumbukumbu ina utujuza kuwepo kwake muenziwa Sheikh Habib Swale Na nzuri sana 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 Omar Kibulanga nakushukuru sana kwa video hii imetufurahisha ime, ime wengi sana sasa hivi nimekaa hapa na hamu na mimi ningekuwa huko lamu nikitembea lakini ndo tuko hapa um, asanteni sana 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 kwa um, kila kitu kwa uh, thank you very much for your presentation kwa mawasilisho yote kwa sasa tuna muda kidogo tunaweza kuchukua maswali tayari tulikuwa tuna mkono mmoja kutoka kwa Morgan So okay, Morgan will be our first um, Morgan has a question Morgan Robinson so Aki if you can um, enable Morgan and then it will be Tom Olali after that Hi Asanteni Vote uh wonderful wonderful questions for two panelists but I will stay brief promise Um, first, um, uh, for uh, Jalul, I was so excited by your paper. I myself write about the process of standardization or the processes, as I like to think about it, trying to take a long-term perspective and taking seriously the different communities involved. And clearly your work is, is going to reflect on mine selfishly in a, in a like, very fruitful, wonderful way. So two questions. First, a specific one. 
would you mind letting me know what year this letter that you quoted um, that Omar wrote to the um, Interterritorial Language Committee? I'd be very interested. Um, and second, I wonder if you've thought at all about the, um, the kind of successor organization, the East Africa Literature Bureau, as, um, as a kind of um, uh, uh, extension of the standardization process or institution um, with the sort of strange project of a colonial institu institution trying to create or promote creativity in a standardized versions of languages and the people that you're writing about kind of bumping up or maybe acting uh, get within that kind of useful tension between standard and non-standard, what has been deemed standard and non-standard. Um, so those are my two questions um, there. And then Francisca, I couldn't help but think about that moment a couple of years ago when Angela Merkel was asked if she considers herself a feminist. And she said, no. And, and, and people in my circles were sort of appalled. Um, and I wonder if you think there's something there, right? There's, there, there was at once her reaction to that specific word or label, which I think is interesting. Um, and then also if perhaps there's too much emphasis, I don't know if we wanna call it in Western feminism or American feminism, where sort of where I come from, um, uh, this overemphasis on, on women in political power, corporate power, economic power, whereas what you're seeing is more this kind of uh, emphasis on ground level grassroots power. So again, thank you very much all. Oh, thank you very much, Morgan. Maybe I'll take two more questions and then and then they can all respond. So I think that the next person was, um, ooh, I've lost the, I've, I've, um, Aki, I'm not sure if you heard. Um, Tom Mulali. Yes, thank you. Um, is it all, um, okay, okay, who was the name? Was it Olali? Could the audience member please put the yeah, so it was up. Tom Olali. Yeah, yeah Tom Olali oh, yeah. is here. Okay. Tom? You can ask. Is he not there? Um, is, uh, Tom, I think you just have to unmute if you can. Maybe he has a problem with the... Maybe, okay, maybe you, is in like, okay, you can start answering while uh, Tom comes on. Was it, okay, Jalul first, yeah? Was it, um... Okay, Tom is here. What do we do? Do we go for Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you like. Maybe please answer first. Okay, so quick answers for that. Thank you very much, Morgan, for, for those statements. And also I look forward to speaking with you further so that I can, uh, I can share some dialogue on this, on this question. Uh, what year is the letter? That was 1961. It's in the Coastal Commission report uh, in the archives. It, it was 1961. That's two years after Matembezi Peponi gets uh, printed. Uh, I'm not sure when it first came on uh, Saudi Amvita as a radio broadcast orally. So the second question, uh, yeah, I've thought about that a little bit uh, as, as the committee morphs. Um, I've really focused mostly on the question around supposed rupture or notions of rupture. Uh, and we see this in two different domains. We see it in terms of African epistemologies, uh, and we see it also in a separate field in terms of Islamic studies. Um, academically, those, those tend to be held apart. People study Islamic Africa, but Islamicists in the kind of classical sense in traditional institutions are thought to be dealing with an area study that's the Middle East. And so there's a kind of artificial separation of those two spaces, and there's not a lot of crosstalk. However, there are these very parallel um, kind of conclusions or, or theorizing uh, around the idea of a rupture, an epistemic rupture that happens with the colonial moment. So what I'm specifically interested in is, is the front end of that and taking it very small at first and then seeing how that kind of ripples outward. But I want to get at this granular thing and specifically 
local Mombasan context with just a few thinkers, just a few writers, translators, teachers, and then see how it kind of ripples outwards uh, and, and cross interrelates with stuff. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you for your time. Wonderful, excited to read it all. And I think next was you, okay, Franzi. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, um, a great comparison with the, with the Angela Merkel example, of course. Um, it, it's exactly as you say, I, I mean, I, I can mainly only agree that it's this overemphasis on women in political positions, in declared political positions, and whether that's Angela Merkel or um, President Samir Suluhu, who are kind of interrogated about their position or against whom these, discuss these discussions are reflected or re-emerge. But at the same time, what um, as I was trying to to make clear, um, most of the people like kept stressing whom I was speaking to is that we need to look beyond and outside of these spaces that are explicitly political, and that somebody was um, um, referring. Sorry, I forgot um, where it came up, but was referring to Clara Safirka's work on, on on poetry, for example, and this is lots to to dive into um, in, for example, um, women's poetry um, from uh, across th those times, and that's that's beautiful. Or or letters, um, exactly also tying into Jalul, what you were presenting from women, and which is beautifully presented in the the. Um, Women Writing Africa a volume uh, that really dives into uh, discourses on like feminist discourses that were at the time, like due to the historical context, not declared as decidedly political, but that uh, were really um, looked for being centered much more strongly in these conceptualizations of how we understand certain ideologies or how they speak to each other. So this is also definitely one direction I'm, I'm trying to think into and to, yeah, to, to respond to that. So thank you for, for pointing that out again. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. So next, Tom Olali, if you have your, if you're ready for uh, open your question. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Does anybody else have any question? If you, if you just put your hand up or if you do type or any comment or any sort of like um, anything you want to add, please uh, okay, let us know. And while that's happening, I just wanted to, so, to say, I just saw that uh, Professor Che Gidiora is in the audience. And uh, so he's one of our founding members of Baraza, but he's now living the, the, the good life in Kenya. And it's just lovely to have you here, uh, Chege. Karibu sana. Laba utazungumza kidogo tutafurai kama utaweza. Oh, there he is. Asante. Yes, there. Asante. Mwanisikia? Nakusikia. Lagini amnioni? Atkuoni. Sasa, sijui kwa nini, ningalipena amnione, ili mjue ni mimi mwenye naongea. Sijui, sawa, um, Sijui kwa, uh, sijui kwa nini, nimezoea sana kutumia platform nyingine, sio Zoom, siku hizi kwa hapa KU tunatumia uh, Google Meet sana sana, sija, sija tumia Zoom kwa siku nyingi kusema ukweli. Lakini hongera sana na nimefurahi sana kuona mambo ya naendelea vizuri na baraza linaendelea na nitachukua na fasi yume nipa ida kwanza kupongeza na wote wengine ambao wanashirika Angelica pia san, asanteni sana kwa kuendeleza kazi zetu na nichukue nafasi ni 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 ni, ni, mpe, ni mulize Omar kidogo siku muliza ni kumshauri kidogo kumpa mawazo amemtaja ya ali, Yahya Ali Omar ambaye alikuwa mwenzetu pale SOAS kwa miaka mingi na nimefurahika sana kusikia anatayarisha kufanya tete kuhusu Yahya Ali Omar Ningependa ajue kwamba eh, alipo waga dunia Yahya Ali Omar, eh, eh, mimi tukishirikiana na Center for African Studies na Angelica alikuwa hapo eh, eh, mstari wa mbele. Eh, mimi mwenyewe nili, nilienda makao yake, apartment yake pale Russell Square, tukachukua, eh, tuka, pamoja na mpo wake mmoja na ishi kule London, vitabu vyake vyote, nyaraka zote na kumbukumbu zake zote, tukasafisha tuka flat yake na African Center of African Studies wakatusaidia wakatupa msaada wakiongozwa na Angelica tukatuma vile vitabu vyote na hivyo kumbukumbu kumbu zake zote mpaka Mombasa ilivikapokewa na National Museums of Kenya ambaye mkurugenzi alikuwa wakati huo ni uh, uh, 
nani ya naitwa nani ile lakini mkurugenzi akavipokea na wamejenga sehemu wametenga sehemu fulani maalum pale kwenye Fort Jesus ambapo kumbukumbu za Yahya Ali Omar vipo kwa hivyo ningependa kumpa hizi habari ili anaweza kuvitumia katika kuunda na kuendeleza kazi yake ya kuhusu Asante sana bwana Omar ni muhimu sana kazi za endo, na hilo hilo ndilo lilikuwa fikra zetu kwamba kazi za Omar zisisahauliwe eh? na unafanya kazi njema sana na mwishowe nilitaka kuuliza swali moja tu kuhusu swale eh, eh, kuhusu eh, eh, swale nilikuwa na bahati kuhudhuria eh, sherehe za eh, kumbukumbu eh, maulidhi ya mwaka wa nafikiri 2003 na nilishangaa nili sana sijawa kuona sherehe kama hii ngoma zilizochezwa na kadhalika swali langu ni hili tunajua sana kuhusu swale eh, habib swale maisha yake langu kule komoro sijapata kusikia hata kidogo background yake ilikuwa nini manake alikuja lamu akiwa mtu mzima akiwa akiwa eh, adult sasa kuna habari zozote kuhusu maisha yake kabla ya kufika eh, Pwani zetu za Kenya. Asante sana. Asante sana sana Chege. Nimefurahi sana kukusikia. <laughs> Naam na. Swali pia linakwenda kwa Jalul ambaye na yeye pia amefanya presentation kuhusu kazi amikazi ya uh, Sheikh. Kwa hivyo labda wote wawe ile Omar na Jalul maybe both of you could respond to Professor Chege. Nimefurahi sana kukusikia leo. E, Sabahani Jalul si, si kupata kukusikia lakini No, Sana, alikuwa, alikuwa mtu wa kwanza asubuhi ilikuwa giza bado ndio maana kiza asaba <laughs> asante so maybe um, Jalul and Omar could respond about the the Comoro link asante na shukran professor chege nimezipokea hongera zako kwa heshima na taadhima na wewe pia hongera zako kwa kuweza kuanzisha jukwa kama ili nzuri la baraza Nikija katika masuala yako mawili kwanza unasema kwamba kumbukumbu ni kazi kubwa ambayo tayari mmeifanya nusu ya kazi mshaifanya kwa kumbukumbu na nyaraka zote za bwana maalim Yahya mshazifikisha for Jesus Mombasa bila shaka katika mikakati yetu tutalizingatia hilo na tukianza pengine tutawasiliana zaidi ili kuweza kutayarisha uh, kitu kizuri zaidi ambacho kitakuwa na manufaa kwa watu wengi swala la Komoro maisha ya Habib Swali kabla ya kuja Kenya ni swala zuri sana. Kama nilivyotangulia kusema kwamba uh, bado ni vijana sisi uwezo kidogo umefungika lakini bado tunatafuta wafdhi kila sehemu nia ipo. Na tayari tumejaribu ku establish links za kujua familia zilizoko Komoro kama ilivyo kwamba maisha yake yaje alikuwa wazi babake alikuwa ni mwalimu akifundisha Qur'an Uh, Sheikh Alwi Jamali Leil na mamake ambaye ni Mariam binti Ali ama maarufu akiitwa mwana msuani maana alikuwa akipenda kuvaa kile kitambaa kizuri cha kichwa kama cha biaida uh, <laughs> sasa kweli kinapendeza kabisa ukienda ukienda katika YouTube ukisearch tete siri soma kibulanga baadhi ya taarifa ya hizo ulizoniuliza utangulizi upo lakini nia ni kwamba baada ya hapa tunataka kwenda kufuatilizia zaidi familia yake na huko nyuma walikuwa vipi na wanaishi vipi na sasa kizazi chake kinaendelea vipi mkumbuke katika nyaraka nyingi na kumbukumbu tulizozipitia uh, watu wananasibisha kwamba kizazi cha Habib Swale kinakwenda mpaka kinashikana na mtume Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ndio maana anaitwa Masharifu ama Mamwenye kwa hivyo hiyo ni silsila kubwa sana ama ni chain kubwa sana ambao lazima tuifuate kwa makini na kwa kuhakikisha lakini habari hizo ni ya hizo zipo na madamu tuna baraka za wazee kama nyinyi na ushirikiano wenu naamini safari itatimia shukran nimemkumbuka jina lake Ahmed Yasin tafadhali Dr. Ahmed Yasin ambaye pia ni mkufunzi wetu wa SOAS na aliandika tasnifu nzuri sana kuhusu ngoma she ya kule eh, Lamu kwa hiyo ukikosa pale unaweza ku contact sante. Asante. Shukran sana. Mtafanya hivyo. Karibu sana. Na umsalibie pia.
Umpe salamu. Asante. Okay. So, asante sana. Um, anybody has anything to add? If not, then we will take a break and come back at um, 11.40. So just to, to let you know, we have set these uh, sort of like um, panels into four panels and you have to re register for each and every one. Kwa hivyo naomba tafadhali kama mtaweza kujiandikisha kwa kila panel ili mweze kuingia katika zote zingine zote tafadhalini. Okay, I'll let Angelica say a word before we let you go for your comfort break. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say the same. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to hear all of you to, um, on panel one. Uh, definitely looking forward to panel two that I'll be chairing. Uh, so yes, we can have a little break and uh, just, yeah, um, we have to uh, re-register. But if you are a panelist, you should have received your panelist link and therefore you don't have to register. It's only if you are an audience, just to, uh, to remind. Anyhow, thank you so much and we see you in uh, 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much, all of you, thank for you. this kind of rule. Yes. Thank you very, very much, Rachel, everybody. Thank you very much. Good to thank see you, Angelica, you. as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hello, Chege. Right. Yeah, hello, hello. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix my, audio, my video you know, by the time we get back. Then yes, please. Yeah, we want to see I'll you. Try. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'll work on it now, yeah. Okay. <laughs>